Each spring, anglers flock to the Detroit River to experience the most amazing walleye migration. Millions upon millions of walleyes are drawn from Lake Erie to the river's swift current to spawn, and the intense fishing action continues through the month of June. But do we fishermen thoroughly understand what's down there and how the walleye, as well as other resident species, position in this somewhat extreme flow? Well, don't click away, because I'm going to visually show you. With the guidance of my son-in-law, Scott Curtis, we'll fish a popular hotspot the local Canadian anglers refer to as the Sturgeon Hole. And as you'll see, it's rightly titled. Taking into consideration the low visibility in turbulent conditions, I chose not to scuba dive, but to safely explore the topography of the river bottom with my AquaView camera. To help prevent you viewers from getting motion sick and to allow us enough time to comprehend the detail, I'll slow the video down. As you can initially see, the bottom is totally blanketed with zebra mussels and every rock along the river floor is encapsulated as well. It's these individual boulders which prove to be key to most of the fish positioning in the river. Not necessarily tight groups with several rocks like this, but scattered individual boulders. Most all the fish we observed were holding in the eddy created by an individual boulder and pointed up current. And not just walleye, but several freshwater drum, red horse suckers, catfish, an infrequent smallmouth or two, and prehistoric giants, all holding behind individual boulders where the current is reduced. <laughs> that looked like a submarine going by. The moving water creates a space devoid of downstream flowing current on the downstream side of these boulders, and the fish can rest in the slack water, conserving energy. This phenomenon is naturally observed in swift flowing rivers behind large emergent rocks, as well as slight humps and dips in the bottom contour. The fish can freely move about, but when they stop and park, they do so behind these objects and depressions where the current is reduced. But you can really see the turbulence down there. Look at the debris churning in the water. I mentioned earlier that the locals call this spot the sturgeon hole. Well, rightly so. We viewed a bunch of them. Lake sturgeon congregate in this particular section of the river where the whole basin reaches a depth of 40 feet. These evolutionary ancient bottom feeders are just one of 27 types of sturgeon, and this particular species happens to be the oldest and largest native fish in the Great Lakes. It's mind-boggling to think that sturgeon actually appear in fossil records more than 200 million years ago. Think about it. That's before the evolution of some dinosaurs, including T-Rex. Having taste buds on and around its barbels to locate food, it uses its elongated shovel-like snout to stir up the bottom sediment along the riverbed, feeding on small organisms. <laughs> Head on. Head on sturgeon. collision. <laughs> was that awesome? Bumped them right on the head. That was the best. Aqua viewing the riverbed was the best. We viewed at least a dozen sturgeon in that hole, hence the name. But what was most astonishing about what we saw was the bottom topography itself. Scott has fished this section of the river for the past several years and had envisioned a bunch of gnarly rebar and broken concrete down there to get snagged on. But that wasn't so. For the most part, at least in this section of the river, the bottom is relatively smooth with rolling hills and valleys along with scattered rocks and boulders. And again, totally blanketed with mussel shells. Staying vertical in the river is crucial to getting a walleye bite. Um, you really have to adjust your speed on your trolling motor depending on the wind. 
If you're on bottom more than a second, you're gonna get snagged up. You have to adjust all the time, depending on the wind. Scott's go-to lure for vertical jigging is a three-quarter ounce Damo's Custom Tackle Jig, and we used a Yamamoto four-inch cuttail worm as the trailer. The addition of a treble stinger hook assured more hookups as well. Fish There's on. no fish on, let me get the net. <laughs> Way to go. Net, good right. job. Good job. Perfect eater. That's what we're looking for. When vertical jigging, you're watching the line and feeling for that little tick of a strike. That's why it's beneficial to spool up with Seaguar Smackdown Flash Green braided line. This braid is highly visible and extremely sensitive. Furthermore, it has no stretch so you get a good solid hook set. In addition to the 20 pound test braid, we added a liter of eight pound Seaguar Tatsu 100% fluorocarbon. Usually early March is when the, uh, the walleye run gets underway here. Uh, you get a lot of guys from out of town coming down here for those big uh, wall hangers. Early March is your prime time to get those big females. They're massive, you can get 10 pound plus down here. Early March. And we're, oh yeah, double header! Oh. <laughs> it's absolutely remarkable as to how many walleye are harvested from the Detroit River each spring while vertical jigging. Limits upon limits, and it's an easy way to fish. I hope you now have a sharper perception of the river topography and how the fish relate to it. Moreover, see the benefit of using an AquaView camera. No doubt you'll become a more well-informed walleye angler if you invest in one. Either the highest resolution of the HD7i125 like we're using today, or the more compact and less expensive AquaView Micro Revolution 5 Pro. You'll find links to these items listed below the video description, and please check them out. A big thanks to Scott for not only putting us on the fish, but serving up an awesome walleye dinner. And an even bigger thanks to all of you for your interest in hook and look. God bless.